Hello, everybody. Hey, Chris. Thanks for inviting me to share a bit on how buildings can enable health and well being. When I was putting this presentation together, it's interesting to think about the global pandemic and how it affects the form and function of buildings in the future and how being away from our workplaces is impacting our productivity, mental health, and fitness. Most of us are working from home and many of the commercial offices, lecture halls, and other spaces are underutilized. I know my home office has had a major upgrade in ergonomics over the past few months, but I am still mostly going into the office, so I'm probably one of the few at the moment that hasn't seen a major change in daily lifestyle. Well, let's get into it and let me give you some context of com commercial building well being and some of the lessons learned in my career as a sustainability consultant. So, I'll just briefly cover a bit of well being and, and buildings and first start off with a bit of history and why we're actually, why it's important. Um, some of the frameworks used to assess wellness within the built environment. Uh, the well building standard, as well as looking at some case studies uh, on well buildings and some of the projects that I've been working on. So, first of all, though, just let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, name's Weston Lewis, been out here in Melbourne for about seven years. Was in your place um, about six years ago. I was taking a couple classes from Chris in my Masters of Environment degree, Energy Studies and Building Efficiency and Modeling. Um, now I'm working at JBA Consulting Engineers and leading the sustainability team on projects there. So what has really inspired me to become a sustainability consultant is just my love for the natural environment, um, getting outside, experienced the incredible Australian coastline, the mountains, um, all of that. But it's also allowed me to realize just how important our buildings are because we spend about 90% of our time in the buildings. Our buildings account for about 40% of GHG emissions. So they have a massive impact on our life, um, on the well-being of, of humans as well as the planet. So the discussion of health within buildings is relatively recent um, and it really had to start with the cases of sick building syndrome. I think there were a few coming out of or quite a bit coming out of California where people were getting asthma um, and having respiratory issues, ongoing chronic health issues because of bad um, indoor environmental quality in buildings. Now this is a slide that I've always liked and used quite a bit a few times. Um, mostly in passive design presentations and energy efficiency, but it also works really well for well-being in terms of the evolution of buildings. Back in you know, 19th century, early days, it was all passive, but we had a lot of pollutants within the building that weren't necessarily controlled. Um, you didn't have very good indoor comfort temperatures. You'd have to rug up, put on a big jacket. Um, you didn't necessarily have you know, heating and cooling at, the, at your fingertips in terms of switching it on and off. Now in the 20th century, we almost over-engineered things. We had too many systems. We had too complex, um, uh, you know, engineering, like take for example, um, Trigen back in uh, the early, about 10 years ago, Melbourne was just putting in tri-generation everywhere. So it's essentially a building becoming a power plant. And what they found out is that a lot of operators just couldn't, couldn't operate, it's just too complex. Um, and now we're getting back to this kind of blend between the 19th, 20th century where we've got passive design and we've got smart systems that are, that are controlling our temperature. We're, we're utilizing natural ventilation, the sunlight, um, natural light. And a lot of this is critical for well-being in buildings. It's taking advantage of, of the natural, environment within the built environment. So as a building practitioner in Melbourne, there's a number of, of things out there that are really driving assessment of buildings in, in relation to health and well-being. Um, the first one is Section J. Now Section J generally deals with energy efficiency 
and that's out of the building code of Australia, BCA. Every project has to undertake a section J analysis. Um, now they've included thermal comfort in the 2019 version of the BCA. So that's a huge move into more of a well being aspect. Um, anything less than that, it sets the minimum bar. Um, anything less is illegal practice. Then we start getting into stuff uh, like Green Star, Passive House, Neighbors, well buildings that are higher performance, that are within innovation. Um, and you don't always get on projects like this because oftentimes, unless you have a developer or some requirement like a, a property council grade A premium office building requirement that requires Green Star or neighbors assessment, which is um, a performance assessment during operations, then you're not always going to be working on um, products or building certifications. Um, and you often either have to figure out how to sell it to the client or, or figure out if it's the right fit in terms of understanding um, the performance benefit of these certifications and frameworks. So as I mentioned, thermal comfort is now a criteria in the BCA. And what this means is that mechanical designers can no longer just decrease the size of the heating and cooling systems to achieve Section J energy efficiency requirements while potentially not delivering adequate heating and cooling. But now designers must put more thought into their designs to be more efficient and effective. Third party verification standards are a good way of demonstrating best practice, benchmarking your building and increasing the markability of your development. There are a few certification frameworks that address wellness. Um, like Green Star, they have a section, Living Building Challenge as well. However, the Well Building Standard is the only one that provides a focused and comprehensive framework on health and well being. Neighbors IEQ, um, that's Indoor Environmental Quality, is an interesting one that's relatively recent, um, as Neighbors is typically a mandatory. Uh, requirement for office buildings in the CBD. Um, IEQ is not mandatory, but it focuses on temperature, acoustics, um, indoor quality like ventilation, levels of pollutant, and it's also a performance-based standard, which means that it requires um, testing and data. So that's something that you know we'll be seeing more in the market. And I think there's probably only about 30 to 40 IEQ certified projects at the moment, which is relatively low to um the hundreds and even i think thousands of energy rated uh, neighbors buildings i like this slide as it paints a picture of just how employ important employees are to a business's ongoing operations and cost so over say the cost of a 30-year cost of a building um the cost of actually creating the building design and constructing is only two percent of the overall expenditure whereas employee wages, benefits, uh, retirement, all, all, all of leave, all of everything associated with the cost of employees is the majority of the cost. So the Property Council of Australia has estimated that for offices, a 1% improvement in productivity would be equivalent to the whole energy cost of a building or nationally $2 billion annually. Here's just another slide that shows some more stats on how important the built environment is for prospective employees and employee satisfaction with the physical workplace design as one of the top three factors which affect performance and job satisfaction. So I'll talk a bit about the well building system and some of the credits and lessons learned that I've in my uh, six years as a well accredited professional. Um, you have to be accredited to uh, be able to work on a well building in terms of certifying it. Anybody can work on one, but they have to have an accredited professional. Um, well buildings are really the only building that focuses solely on human health and well being. So it's a great framework um, for you all if you're trying to learn more about how the built environment impacts. Um, health, you know, it's it's a free standard online, so you can go in and, and look at all the initiatives, the op, op, they call them optimizations, um, but it's really detailed to provide you some good um, 
reasons why it's being done, why, why they're selecting it, but also performance benchmarks, which is important um, and something that I use quite often in my projects, even though I may not have a WILP uh, certified project, I go in and I look at say um, water or light um, and I can use those optimizations as a benchmark of best practice in buildings that I'm working on. So the components, um, the initiatives of the well building standard represent a comprehensive set of strategies organized by specific impacts on health and well being. Many features of the standard are ascribed to one or more of the body systems. So air is the first um, category within the well building standard and it sets performance thresholds for indoor environmental quality or air quality. Um, and it deals a lot with pollution, um, making sure you have adequate um, uh, ventilation, that carbon dioxide is not building up. It, it sets levels for, for many um, pollutants, potentially having um, a weather station on your building if you have natural ventilation that can control windows. So when we're looking at air, it can actually be quite an expense to commercial buildings. Say if they want to have operable windows, they're gonna to need to have uh, mechanically operated windows that can tell us when outdoor air quality is too bad um, to have the windows open and, and it forces you to shut. Um, generally, Melbourne is, is kind of blessed with great air quality. So I lived in California for a bit of time working as a as a sustainability analyst uh, about 10 years ago, and the, the air quality there is horrible. And um, it really, really makes sense to have high levels of, of air purification, which, which is quite expensive to have these big filters on your mechanical system, um, which in a lot of buildings here, we don't necessarily have. Um, but it's not necessarily having that imperative to really do it because we're, we've got really good air quality. But, um, what I noticed is with events like um, the bushfires earlier this year, I mean, we had some of the worst, worst air quality on, on record. Um, look, in Canberra, you know, it's worse than New Delhi, which is, which is horrible. And it's extreme, unhealthy, and, um, and risky to be outside, especially to be exercising. And so I've got a I've got a mate who works in uh, building operations and he said that during this period he had to have so many calls out call out to um, commercial offices because of the dust and the smoke that's getting stuck in the mechanical systems because there weren't there isn't adequate um, ventilation um, or, or filtration and so a lot of these commercial buildings are filling up with dust um, having just the smoke smell um, and if you can't, you know, escape it by getting inside, um, then you, you're, you're constantly exposed to horrible air quality and the people who are at risk, who have health issues are really going to be the ones that suffer the most. So I think as a result of the fires, we're going to be seeing a lot more focus on indoor air quality filtration um, because we can't just rely on um, outdoor air being fresh, um, sea breezes that don't have pollution or particulates in it. Um, another, another thing to think about when it comes with air quality is also your building leakage. Um, I know my, my home, for example, is, is it, all, all it takes is a gust of wind and all the indoor air um, just gets blown out um, because it's so leaky. I can actually feel the wind blowing through and during the bushfire times, I could smell a lot of the smoke indoors and it wasn't, you know, I could tell that it was affecting my health negatively. Another major section of well is, is water and um, it establishes requirements to um, have adequate fresh water. So filtration as well as promote um, fresh drinking water within the buildings. Um, I think this is another one where we're kind of, um, at an advantage in Melbourne where we don't necessarily need such high levels of water filtration. Um, when I was living in Southern California, this is another one where we would have 
really, really bad municipal water. And um, the water was really hard and it would, um, there's a lot of calcium in it, a lot of minerals and, and you would um, get a lot of deposits say on drinking fountains and, and water faucets fixtures. Um, and that you could really taste the chlorine that's been put in it. And so water filtration is, you know, very, very common say in California, and I'm sure it's pretty common in, um, you know, big cities in China and, and, and Delhi and things like that. But um, Australia is particularly Melbourne, we've got, we've got great water. So um, when we're trying to sell to say a building um, owner or developer that we need this extra uh, filtration and monitoring and, and, and testing that, um, you know, they're going to say, why, why do we need it? We've got fresh water. But um, look, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's not that much to say put it in a reverse osmosis system a lot of um billy taps or kind of the little office uh water taps are pretty common and, and they have filtration as well as um it's great to promote drinking water so having uh, regular access throughout the building to um to fresh drinking water the next concept is nourishment i think this one is a very underrepresented uh, concept within the industry. Um, you don't see nourishment within any other building standard, um, but it's so important because what's the fact? I think it's like 40% of both the US and Australian populations are obese. So much of that can be attributed to poor diet. Um, a lot of the times it's just not having ex access to fresh fruits and vegetables and healthier foods, and it's just easier to go to say, you know, maccas and um, load up on cheeseburgers and chips. Um, so with this one, you would need to provide uh, fruits and vegetables. Um, typically, you know, in my office, we don't have, uh, you know, full preparation food where you have um, dining halls or anything like that. Some of the big companies like Google and Apple, you know, they provide food for their employees and um, this is where you would really get into, you know, labeling the types of food that you're providing, um, uh, making sure that you have healthy selections, uh, fruits and vegetables, and, and uh, people know the calorie intake. Um, at my work, you, in order to achieve this, where we don't have a big, big hall and people bring in their own food, you just provide fruits and vegetables um, as like a snack. Um, but... Yeah, I think it's about 11% of heart disease deaths, as well as 9% stroke deaths can be attributed to insufficient fruits and vegetable intake, which is quite, quite alarming when, when um, eating a banana or apple a day um, is pretty inexpensive and, and um, you know, could, could really help significantly decrease these risks. Next up is light. So this is one that gets a lot of attention in a lot of different rating systems. Council requires oftentimes for large buildings, daylight modeling as a condition of planning. So even before they will um, grant a building a planning permit, they wanna see that this building can, can have adequate daylight. Um, and what that means is that there's a huge body of research that shows just how important daylight is on um, occupant health and well-being, circadian rhythms, as well as reducing energy um, within the workplace. So one of the one of the things that I kind of like about this section is circadian rhythm. So what this means is, is that you have an internal body clock. And if you don't receive around two hours of sunlight a day, then you don't go through your normal sleep awake cycle. So you won't be as fully alert um, during the day and you probably won't sleep as well during the night. Um, so it's, this, is, this is critical and it's in all animals have it. Um, so getting exposure to natural light is just fundamental. So it, to implement this in the workplace, you would have circadian rhythm design. And what that means is that lights can have different um, temperatures, which typically ranges from about 2700K to 6500K. Um, and so what that does is it, it represents an artificial sunrise, sunset to give your body that natural rhythm. Um, one of the other benefits of this that isn't necessarily um, described in the well building standard is flexibility of the space. So 
I was working on a project and it was, it was a bit of a more of a meeting room. Um, but by providing a daylight as well as warm light, the space was able to be a much more flexible in its use. So during the day, um, it was, it was used as, um, you know, an art gallery, a gathering area, kind of a breakout lunch space. Whereas at night we could lease it out and, um, have it as a, a yoga studio where um, you can have you know, different temperatures of light that are more um, geared towards different uses. For, like I said, for, for buildings, we're always doing light studies. This is a model that I made um, for one of the projects. This is a residential one, but um, here is a planning submission image that I submitted for an office floor plate showing um, really, really good daylight levels um, around the space. So in that top, was it Eastern top, uh, say nine o'clock is where North is. And so we spent a bit of time with the architect really nailing down this facade. As you can see, it's a, it's a wild one. The blue shows uh, PV panels um, integrated into the facade. And what we've done is we tried to maximize the amount of exposure that these PV panels would get to direct sunlight. But what that also does is reduce glare because anywhere where you have direct sunlight, um, you can see in these, these uh, images in this gradient image where you have a lot more direct sunlight, say in the green areas, um, you get high contrast and that causes glare and that causes discomfort, eye strain, um, if you're in that darker area in the center and you're looking out, you're going to have glare and you're not going to be able to see as well. So the fitness category addresses active workplaces. It tries to um, make stairs accessible, create friendly pedestrian environments and uh, supporting fitness facilities. So I look at one aspect of this quite a bit on projects where I personally like to use the stairs a lot. I feel like I can get a little bit of exercise during the day when I'm, when I'm um, maybe walking up and down the floors, um, when I enter and exit the building, go, go for a little coffee break and I wanna use the stairs. But what I do find in a lot of projects is that it's difficult to create active stairs that meet the well building standards. So what they say is that it needs to have windows or, um, or some type of uh, vegetation in terms of biophilia, um, natural light, you've got music, art. And what I run up against is typically the fire requirements because in some of the buildings, you may only have one staircase or two staircases and they're typically fire stairs and they have to have certain levels of um, fire protection, which means that you may not be able to have windows or fresh, fresh air. And so that makes it a bit difficult, but, you know, take for example, this Russ medical center, um, they're, they're quite switched on to well, and they find that um, stairs are, are pretty important within the medical facility, allowing people just to get that little extra bit of exercise during the day. So comfort is one that is addressed in a lot of different rating systems and one that I spoke about briefly when it came to the new Section J BC, BCA Building Code of Australia and their emphasis now on thermal comfort. But there's also acoustic comfort, ergonomic comfort, so making sure that your workplace is set up properly so that you're not getting a sore back or, you know, crick in the neck, olfactory parameters, so smells. Um, so part of this is having adjustable furniture, uh, good delivery of heating and cooling, making sure that your acoustics are correct. Um, and then one of the things that I found though on a lot of projects is that if you don't plan, and I wanna emphasize this critical really with everything is that you gotta get this in early. The later you wait, the more expensive and the harder it is gonna be to design into the building. Take for example, the partition wall acoustics. This is one where a lot of architects you know, builders, they've, they've got a standard wall and they don't necessarily know the, the implications of designing to a well building wall that has a, a certain standard for acoustics. So acoustic transfer. So this is, take for example, this is a project that I work, I'm working on with the Department of Health and Human Services, which I'll touch on briefly later. But um, 
we went through a bit of an exercise with our acoustic consultant to try and figure out what's the best wall type and off and what we decided was there's there's some options where it requires additional um plasterboard which is which is quite a big big of a cost and it also adds depth to the depth to the wall which reduces the net lettable area of the space and so a lot of times you'll get resistance particularly from developers who say look this is going to be an added cost and it's going to take up space so what's the benefit and you know there there definitely is a benefit to it um and you've got to be able to communicate that benefit but sometimes these are the, the challenges that you run up against the next one is mine and so this really looks at aesthetics and so making sure that you have things within your building that is that are beautiful because if you don't you know value your building you're not going to take care of it you're not going to take pride um in in your space as well as uh you know making sure it's it's re you have a relaxing space you have connection to community and you have access to knowledge so when we're talking about all of these imperatives the well building process is a bit of a, a long process so you have to design it into the building there may be three years of design and construction and then after the building's built you need a year of performance data and inspections and commissioning in order to get a, a building certification so if you're a developer and you're not owning the building and if you're not going to be in it long term it's it can be tough to commit to one of these certifications because oftentimes you develop to sell it as a as a financial asset and that's when it kind of becomes a difficult process whereas if take for example um arup they're an engineering consulting firm they, they commission a new office in um the docklands that is well certified and because they're they're going to be operating that office for years to come they had a direct incentive to maybe invest a little bit more in the process and to stick with it in order to have that well certified building so uh crbe is a real estate um, company and and they've also invested in a well office in sydney there's a bit of data on just from their employees on just how it performs and their their satisfaction with with the project and as you can see here, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty incredible how, how much positive uh, of a response the employees have had. Here's just a photo of it and it's 636 George Street. So they got a gold certification. Um, features include, you know, sit stand desks for ergonomics, toxin free furniture fittings. So to prevent off gassing um of, of voc so volatile organic compounds low glare lighting to ensure productivity um, catering guidelines so when they when they cater food they need to have healthy options here's another picture of the office uh, they also have a five-star neighbors indoor environmental quality rating which is yeah, like I said earlier, there's only about 30 commercial offices in Australia that have a rating of five stars or above at the moment. Um, so yeah, this was really fundamental to their approach and building management. And it's something that they're seeing essentially dividends um, in operations. And then here is a case study in terms of the financial impact of implementing well and for a business that's going to be operating over over many years this is this is nothing in terms of cost um getting it in early at the stage so it is about 360 per square foot so that's you know probably double that per meter but um yeah it's it's they're, what they're finding is it's a big payback particularly when you're building these grade a commercial buildings because you're already having to deliver a certain standard now if you're looking at say a well building versus a grade c commercial office which um doesn't have to have such a high level of, of standard then you may see that cost uh, differential being a bit more 
So here's a project that I'm working on at the moment and it's called Harvest Square. So it's not actually a well certified or well targeted project. We actually, we're gonna have four green star ratings on it. So it's almost 200 dwellings up in Brunswick. And you can see that uh, this is the landscape plan. And what we, we're really emphasizing on is kind of the activity and as well as the food production of the site. And so while it's Green Star, Green Star allows you to have innovations and to use well as part of your um, score in order to achieve say a five-star Green Star rating. So to the north of the site, we've got about, yeah, right up here, we've got about 1.5, meters square of food production area per occupant of of the site and so that's one of the things that we're really trying to promote and we're using well as the benchmark so we we went in there with the idea of um really providing a site that is promotes health and well-being of the occupants because it is social housing and so there are a lot of disadvantaged uh, people within the site and so having a site that's active that's that's vegetated that um, you know connects the community is is really important and a fundamental part of the vision of of this development um, so all of the little squares up there the the garden planters as well as this big north south uh, active corridor we're going to have drinking fountains throughout playscapes um, weight facilities, exercise facilities, I think a chess table built in with ping pong, uh, table tennis. And um, so we, yeah, we are targeting that food production credit, as well as um, encouraging gardening support in the form of training, educational opportunities and equipment that is made available. So it's not just in the design, but it's how we operate. And what it does is it requires commitment from the operator, which is something that is quite different from a lot of, a lot of rating systems and frameworks. So here's a bit of a um, zoom up on perspective on the north end of the site where we're providing you know, open connections to this uh, Peacock Street with fruit trees. So when anybody can come by and just pick a lemon or a lime, so really active, and promoting healthy environments. Here are just a few other well-certified projects that I encourage you to have a look at. There's some good case studies out there. And now it's time for a bit of Q&A. So looking forward to having a bit of a chat with you after this with Chris. Um, yeah, thanks for your time. Cheers.